Okay, um, awesome. Well, uh, again, um, thanks, uh, Dr. Horvath, for uh, joining us for the questions here. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk um, and, and uh, you know, this the, the breakdown of how the epigenetic clocks work. Um, and there's a couple of questions here and, you know, they kind of go uh, across the board um, from, I guess, uh, clinical questions to more um, evolutionary. Um, and please bear with me if I've asked you this question before, because um, it, my mind's a little blurry from <laughs> the meetings that we've been having so far. Um, well, one question that we have is, and I don't know if you addressed this, could you explain the correlation of FEV with mortality? And I think that's talking about respiratory function. Um, I don't know if you did address that, or maybe that's... Um, that I addressed that it, but I'll address it again. Why not? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, so FEV is um, a very well-known predictor of uh, human longevity. Um, it measures lung function. And... Um, in that sense, it's no surprise that it also correlates with our best estimator of um, uh, mortality risk that is based on cytosine methylation, which is grim age. Mm -hmm. And uh, grim age has been linked to lung function. It has been linked to kidney function. It has been linked to even brain uh, cognitive assessments. So yeah, it relates to many organs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so next question is, uh, is that you said that Grim H2 has lower technical variability than the original Grim H and Levine reported that Grim H1 had median deviation between technical replicates of 0 0.9 years with a maximum deviation of 2.4 years. Do you concur with that as the variability of Grim H1 and what are the corresponding numbers for Grim H2? Yes, I concur with that, um, that Grim H number one had that variance, and um, which isn't bad when you think about it, because imagine you are 50 year old, and let's say there's a technical variance of one year, this is like 2%, you know, so it's not bad at all. Um, however, it is frustrating for people who do clinical trials, you know, and um, mm -hmm. And so I would say um, version two has roughly half the technical variation um, of uh, version one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question is, have you compared calculating biological age with Grim H2, including its surrogates for um, HbA1c, et cetera, to simply factoring in the actual individual blood results for all those non-methylation biomarkers into the calculation? Oh, yeah, I don't understand the question. Yeah, let's see. Let me let me let me go that a little slower here. Yeah. Have you compared calculating biological age? Um, because I'm reading that for the first time with Grim H2, including its surrogates uh, for a number of other factors, such as uh HbA1c, etc. I guess two. So comparing that to simply factoring in the actual individual blood results for all of those non-methylation biomarkers into the uh, calculation. Um, yeah. Um, no, I have not compared that. And the reason is for many studies, we don't have the plasma proteins available, so we couldn't do the comparison. Okay. Um, and there's another question here, and uh, I think I, I, I have some viewpoints on this too. One is, does the success of epigenetic clocks imply that aging is not an accumulation of damage? If I mimic the epigenome of my younger body, will I have the same risk of mortality? That's the million dollar question, <laughs> you know, I, um, I don't quite know. Um, it would be nice if, um, if the epigenome um, um, is a very good surrogate of your mortality risk. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that's certainly the hope, you know, that, um, and I really mean it in this very broad way. I don't mean cytosine levels. I really mean the entire epigenome, including histone modifications mm -hmm. and so on. So the question is, if you restore um, the epigenome to that of a youthful um, cell, um, do you then have the benefits of that? You know, and um, yeah. I, I don't quite know. I yeah. hope so. You know. Mm -hmm. I know there was a paper published last year where they looked at somatic mutation levels and as they go up in, in, um, in tissues, uh, both the rate in different species and also the, the, the total overall absolute level at the end. So, um, 
so yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of more work to be done, and you know, and to see whether or not maybe the epigenome correlates with those mutation levels, and whether or not those mutation levels get reversed. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think it reverses the somatic mutations. You know, what I can tell you is I've done analogous studies for um, methylation changes, and the rate of change of methylation in different species is highly correlated with maximum lifespan. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that gets into some species questions. And I had actually had a question myself because I know you were, you were showing a lot of different um, rates of methylation states for different species. And like my, my kind of scientific question is based on all the data that you've accumulated and all the information that you have available now, do you think you can take a species that you haven't looked at yet and looked at its methylation status from, let's say, one age point to another age point? And then predict based on that rate what the maximal theoretical lifespan is of that species. Yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, cool. I'm hesitating a little bit because yeah. um, there is um, a, a bit of a mathematical bias going on. People don't appreciate that, which is the, the minute you calculate a velocity, a rate of change, and that could be a rate of change of methylation, a rate of change of somatic mutation, rate of change of telomere shortening, really any rate of change. Mm -hmm. In the Once you calculate it, that rate of change formula has a mathematical bias, <laughs> which immediately means it, re in many cases, it relates to maximum lifespan, you know, mm -hmm. and the, uh, it has to do with the denominator when you divide by by the chronologic age, but um, that um, I, I think I need to give a talk on that at another occasion. But <laughs> short answer is it relates strongly to maximum lifespan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, what got me thinking about that too is something that uh, Vadim Gladyshev said, which I found a little startling, which was that the at least looking at mortality um, numbers for some organisms like uh, the naked mole rat, they don't seem to go down over time. And I thought to myself, hmm, I know that other changes happen over time. And I'm just wondering whether or not you could look at the methylation, the, the rate of change and, and, and see whether or not, because I know a lot of species have a predicted maximal lifespan, if whether or not you could look at that and say, Oh wait, we have a we have a you know uh, incongruity here. It's actually maybe the naked mole rat actually theoretically should be have a maximal lifespan of 100 years instead of what is already published, which is 35 years. I'm not sure. I'm just... Yeah, you know, I, I did look at the naked mole rat in great detail. You know, we published a paper just mm -hmm. a few months ago in Nature Aging on that. What I can tell you is um, um, definitely the naked mole rat ages on, on a methylation level, no question, even young animals. Mm -hmm. And also um, the predicted lifespan, which um, maximum lifespan, which uh, right now people think is about 38 years. Mm -hmm. And that's very much aligned with the predictions um, mm -hmm. based on the methylation measurements. You know. Yeah, so, so this, um, but then you say, well, how is that even possible? But then my explanation is there's another very um, exceptional animal in terms of maximum lifespan which is humans right mm -hmm. we also live right. very long right. life right and you can build a very accurate epigenetic clocks for humans you know mm -hmm. and so um so this mystery about the naked mole rat is the same mystery about humans you know and um so my interpretation with the naked mole rat is that if you really looked at mortality rates late in life, very late in life, you would detect an increase. That's my prediction. Uh, I just don't know when it starts. Uh, come to humans, right? Imagine you study humans, which incidentally, 2000 years ago, how long did humans live? Well, around age 30, right? <laughs> age 30, 35. Um, and, and then you could have said, oh, humans have the, this negligible senescence, you know. And um, if you just studied aging in humans between zero and 30 or 35, you know. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I just think if we followed the naked mole rat um, to, till age 
40 or 45, mm -hmm. we would see a Gompertz law. That's my prediction. Interesting. Yeah, it could be that they have a very compressed morbidity. Very. Yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah. that's what I think. Yeah. yeah. But I, this is wild speculation, but that's right. my hypothesis. I well, I mean, that's part of science. I love the wild speculation and, <laughs> and trying, to, trying to think about where that would lead you. Um, so this isn't part of the questions, but I, I just... I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. This is one of my questions is when you calculate these clocks, when you do these clocks and, and you compare chronological age, which is, you know, just a number that we have that's, you know, after birth and, and you say, and you have your biological clock estimate that is based on populations that you use to, to calibrate these methylation clocks. How does that, you know, how does that change over time? And, and, and is that, would that, would that need to be corrected? And would, you know, would that skew your biological clock based on the population you compare it to and which populations are you using? Because you could, you know, if you, if you have the way I'm thinking about it, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. If you have a, you know, if you have a very, very, very healthy population, then, then, then shouldn't the biological and chronological clocks start to get to, you know, equal you know you would you would not yeah. you would you wouldn't you wouldn't be veering off from the you know the reason is the chronological clock is off because it's it's kind of a rough metric but if if, if you have a very homogeneous population then the chronological and the biological pop you know clocks homogeneous in terms of in terms of environment and genetics it sh they should be very identical or close right? yeah i think um i mean i think you are right i do want to mention there's definitely a genetic component to it, you know, so um, epigenetic deviations are heritable. And we can have debates, what is the heritability? Is it 20%? Is it 40%? You know, um, but, uh, but there's that component. But let's say you deal with um, inbred mice, right? So, uh, same genetics. Um, you still see deviations, you know, and then the question is, why is that, you know, so could it be various stress factors? Um, I don't know why certain mice um, would be more stressed than others, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and what is the stress? Is it a metabolic stress or uh, what kind of stress? Um, oh, and by the way, yes, metabolic stress very much accelerates the epigenetic age, you know, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, ideally one should really define epigenetic clocks in uh, relatively healthy human beings, right? In order to um, um, kind of have a benchmark. Mm -hmm. And um, the other statement is, ideally we would like to have uh, longitudinal data, right? Mm -hmm. the, the problem is um, who collects it, you know? But Im imagine you collected methylation data on humans, um, at birth, you start at um, um, at birth, and you collect it each year. I mean, that would be a brilliant data set mm -hmm. to then model really epigenetic aging rates. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so let's see what we have here. Uh, question related to again species: um, What about the epigenetic clocks in especially long-lived animals like turtles or lobsters? I guess that's a just yeah, there is, um, yeah, there is an interesting publication where another team developed an epigenetic clocks for, I think it's called a European lobster. You can do a Google search mm -hmm. on it. And I liked it a lot, you know. Um, so when it comes to epigenetic clocks for turtles, I haven't looked at that. I think it will work because all vertebrates have cytosine methylation. Mm -hmm. And I just think when will be able to build these clocks. But maybe somebody will find a vertebrate where you can't build an epigenetic clock. That would hmm. be interesting, you know. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely would be. Um, so on that theme, um, this is an interesting question. Interesting, could the mammalian clock be used to interrogate whether the blastema that forms during limb regeneration of the Xenopus, African clawed frog, is a younger cell mass? Um, asking for my regeneration friends. Yeah, um, I'm working on that question, um, uh, but not in the uh, frog, but rather in axolotls, you know. And mm. I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, but um, getting there. All right. I, I, I may have an answer in about a month or so. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. 
And uh, next question, that's a follow-up to that. Correlation of 0.88 in the African clawed frog is very impressive. Suggests a conservation in the aging signal across species um, or the process. Has there been interest in using it to understand the regeneration ability of the African clawed frog? Um, Long-standing question is whether the blastema that forms during limb regeneration in froglets reverses in age or if it's the same. Uh, the same age as the rest of the body, but reverts to a more pluripotent state. Would the use of mammalian clocks be helpful in starting to answer this question? I think you partly answered that question. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's very interesting. Um, and um, unfortunately, I don't study it in the clawed frog, but uh, only in the axolotls. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, wow, lots of good questions. And uh, somebody mentioned that cytosine methylation often happens after DNA replication. Have you tested the second generation clocks in cells that do not divide? Yes. Um, so this, just to remind everyone, the second generation clocks are meant to predict mortality risk and morbidity risk. And um, there are two widely used clocks. One is PhenoAge, and people have used um, even in our original publication with Morgan Levine, we applied it to brain um, samples, you know, um, with, uh, and neurons, you know, and, and it kind of worked in that context. Um, but when it comes to grim age, I'm um, actually quite nervous applying it to neurons or heart tissue because I, I just think grim age is truly a blood based biomarker, maybe saliva based biomarker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I don't know if you mentioned any of these studies, I can't recall, but uh, there are two questions that are related to two studies, which is um, Catcher, and they're asking if this preprint has been published in a peer-reviewed journal yet, and, and, and another study by, by uh, Clement, I believe, and I'm not sure if uh, you're aware of those studies and if it's been put in, if it's been ready for print anywhere. Yeah, so the study, with James Clement, this clinical trial, that should come out in, I don't know, a week or two weeks. You know, this is, um, we just submitted the proofs. Um, when it comes to the study with Harold Ketcher, um, it's, um, I'm waiting for one more replication data set, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, because we observed this dramatic rejuvenation effect of 54%, all of us felt the need to also really nail it and provide um, evidence that everybody believes. So we're doing a replication study. Mm. It's been delayed by COVID, you know, I have mm. to say, I mean, it's a bit frustrating, but we're getting there. Yeah, yeah hopefully we're... A lot of the labs were closed during the COVID shutdown, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ground everything to a halt. Um, but anyway, I think you've tackled um, tackled all the questions that I had here. Um, so, um, okay, good. so I, so I appreciate you joining me, um, so we can, mm -hmm. so we can answer everybody's, uh, burning questions and, uh, going to send this off to Keith and, uh, we'll have it posted, but, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, you know, thanks for doing it. It was I a lot of, a lot of fun. And really your, your talk was really insightful. Um, biomarkers are definitely, um, that's something that, uh, everybody here in leaf lifespan myself were really, you know, intrigued and read a lot of papers on and, uh, so cool. yeah yeah i hope next time we meet in person all the yes. best